Thank you for joining us for our service of worship today. And as part of the service, we will be celebrating the Lord's Supper. So if you want to, you know, pause the video at this point and go get some juice and a piece of bread or whatever. So when we get to that point in the service, we can celebrate the Lord's Supper together. Our call to worship this morning is taken from Psalm 46, where we find these words, The Lord liveth and blessed be the rock. And let the God of my salvation be exalted. And that's what we seek to do when we come to worship him. We've come to honor and worship and praise and exalt and adore this God who loved us so much that he sent his son to bring us back to himself. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for the privilege of gathering for worship in the building, in the parking lot, on line. And we've come to praise you and thank you for all that you do for us and all that you are. Bless our time together. In Jesus' name, amen. One of the hymns that I have for us this morning is uh, a worship chorus that is taken from Revelation chapter 4. Thou art worthy. Thou art worthy. Thou art worthy, thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory, glory and honor, glory and honor and power. For thou hast created, hast all things created. Thou hast created all things. And for thy pleasure, for they are created. Thou art worthy, O Lord. He is worthy of our worship, of our devotion, of our praise, of our service, of our sacrifice, and so much more. The message for this morning is taken from Isaiah chapter 45, verses 1 through 5. This is what the Lord says to his anointed, to Cyrus whose right hand I take hold of to subdue the nations before him and to strip kings of their armor, to open doors before him so that gates will not be shut. I will go before you and will level the mountains. I will break down the gates of bronze and cut through bars of iron. I will give you hidden treasures, riches stored in secret places so that you may know that I am the Lord, the God of Israel, who summons you by name for the sake of Jacob, my servant of Israel, my chosen. I summon you by name and bestow on you a title of honor, though you do not acknowledge me. I am the Lord, and there is no other. Apart from me, there is no God. I will strengthen you though you have not acknowledged me, so that from the rising of the sun to the place of its setting, people may know there is none besides me. I am the Lord, and there is no other. Here is the reading, ends the reading of God's word for this morning. Sometime around the year 700 BC, the prophet Isaiah gave an amazing prophecy in which he stated that God would use someone named Cyrus to deliver his people from captivity. This was fulfilled in 536 BC, perhaps 150 or 160 years later, when Cyrus the Great of Persia invaded Babylon and took the city and released the Jews who had been taken captive by the Babylonians 70 years before with instructions to return to Jerusalem and rebuild the temple. This prophecy was given in a time of great idolatry. Isaiah prophesied during the reigns of Hezekiah and his father Ahaz. It was during the reign of Ahaz that Isaiah gave the prophecy concerning the Lord's miraculous birth in Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14. And I'm sure that most all of us are familiar with that prophecy. Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, a virgin will be with child and bear a son, and she will call his name Emmanuel. 
Manasseh followed his father Hezekiah to the throne. According to the Jewish Talmud, which is the Jewish commentaries on the Bible, Isaiah prophesied into Manasseh's reign and was martyred when Manasseh ordered him to be sawn in two. The scriptures do not make direct reference to Isaiah's death, but they do tell us in 2 Kings chapter 24, verses 2 and 3. Surely, these things happened to Judah according to the Lord's command in order to remove from them his presence, speaking of Manasseh, because of the sins of Manasseh and all he had done, including the shedding of innocent blood, for he filled Jerusalem with innocent blood blood and probably the blood of Isaiah as well. In Hebrews chapter 11 verse 37 we're told this about the people of faith in the Old Testament. Many were put to death by stoning. They were sawed in two. They were killed by the sword. They went about in sheepskins and goatskins, destitute, persecuted, and mistreated. Certainly, this could be a reference to how Isaiah died. But the point is, Ahaz and Manasseh were two of the most idolatrous kings to ever sit on the throne of Judah. And it was during a period that Isaiah prophesied, looking forward to the time when God would raise up a leader after his people's 70 years of captivity in Babylon, which hadn't even happened yet, who would make it possible for God's people to once again return home to rebuild the temple and the city of Jerusalem and restore the worship of the one true God. And Isaiah prophesied these things, including the very name of this anointed leader over 150 years before it all happened. Impossible. Impossible unless the words came from the one true God who alone knows all things from eternity past to eternity to come. And he is giving this prophecy to his servant Isaiah to show us that he alone is the one true God and that he can tell in advance what is going to happen and what he is going to do. Although our focus this morning is Isaiah chapter 45, this prophecy concerning Cyrus is spread over a number of chapters to remind us of how great and awesome and how trustworthy this God we worship and serve truly is. And why is that important for us to see and to understand? Because we too live in an age of growing godlessness and unbelief and rebellion. And we need to know that our faith is not futile and that it is grounded in a God so great and so powerful that he can tell us what is going to happen hundreds of years before it happens in order that we will not get discouraged and lose heart in this time of growing spiritual darkness and unbelief. We need to understand that whatever he has promised in the Holy Scriptures will come to pass. In Isaiah chapter 44, verse 28, the Lord names this leader that he will raise up. His name is Cyrus. Earlier in chapter 4, there is an extended discourse concerning the folly of, idol, 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 of idolatry. And let me share just two verses from that discourse. Verses 6 through 8 of chapter 44, where we read, This is what the Lord says, Israel's King and Redeemer, the Lord Almighty. I am the first of the last. You ever heard that before? Of course you have in reference to how Jesus describes himself. I am the first, the last. Apart from me, there is no God. Who then is like me? Let him proclaim it. Let him declare and lay, lay out before me what has happened since I established my ancient people and what is yet to come, yes, let them foretell what will come. Do not tremble, do not be afraid, did I not proclaim this and foretell it long ago? 
you are my witnesses. Is there any God besides me? No. There is no other rock. I know not one. Who then is like him, this God we worship and serve? None. There is no other rock, no other savior than the one who reveals himself to us in the scriptures of the Old and New Testaments and supremely in his son, our savior. The world around us mocks and ridicules us and our God, but they are the ones who should tremble and be afraid. It is our God who is on the throne and who controls even the minutest detail of history for his honor and glory and the saving of those who belong to him. So be encouraged this morning. Here in chapter 45, the Lord again names Cyrus and reveals many details concerning his identity some 150 years before he comes on the scene of history. Verse 1. This is what the Lord says to his anointed, to Cyrus, whose right hand I take hold of to subdue the nations before him, to strip kings of their armor, to open doors before him so that gates will not be shut. Let's look at each, each passage in that verse for a moment. To his anointed. The ceremony of anointing was used in crowning Jewish kings. There was no similar ceremony known among the pagan nations of the world of that day. It meant that Cyrus, a non-Jew, was set apart to carry out the purpose of the one true God to release his people from their captivity in Babylon. That's how powerful that our God is. The next phrase, to subdue the nations before him. As the book of Ezra begins, Cyrus, the king of Persia, king over what had been the Babylonian Empire, issues a proclamation concerning the Jews in captivity in Babylon. As he does, he acknowledges that Jehovah, the God of the Jews, was the one who had indeed given him the power to subdue the nations before him. Let me read verses 2 and 4 through in Ezra chapter 1. This is what Cyrus, king of Persia, says. The Lord, the God of heaven, has given me all the kingdoms of the earth and has appointed me to build a temple for him at Jerusalem in Judah. Any of his people among you may go up to Jerusalem in Judah and build the temple of the Lord, the God of Israel, the God who is in Jerusalem, and may their God be with them. And in any locality whose where survivors may now be living, the people are to provide them with silver and gold, with goods and livestock, and with free will offerings for the temple of God in Jerusalem. The next part of verse 1. To open doors before him so that gates will not be shut. And also verse 2. I will go before you and, and will level the mountains. You are my witnesses. Is there any God besides me? No, there is no other rock. I know not one. I will break down the gates of bronze and cut through bars of iron. Isaiah is telling us 150 years before Cyrus appears on the scene. The Lord tells us that he will go before him. He will level mountains of opposition. He will break down gates of bronze and cut through bars of iron. And I think here's a reference to the taking of the city of Babylon. The city of Babylon had 25 massive brass gates supported by brass frames on each of the four sides of the city. 100 brass gates in all, seemingly making the city of Babylon impenetrable. But this prophecy here in chapter 45, again, 150 years or so before Cyrus defeated all the surrounding nations, including the city of Babylon, the Lord declares that it was 
his might and his power that would give the city to Cyrus by breaking down those massive gates protecting the city. To me, this is reminiscent of the fall of Jericho when God brought down the words of the walls of Jericho when all the when all the when all that the Israelites did was to march around the city seven times and on the seventh day marched around the city seven times and shouted in obedience to God's command and the walls came tumbling down this prophecy is clear that it was not the might of Cyrus or his troops that gave the surrounding nations in the city of Babylon into his hands but the might and the purpose of the God of the Jews in captivity there in the city and the kingdom of Babylon. Verse 3, I will give you hidden treasures, riches stored in secret places, so that you may know that I am the Lord, the God of Israel, who summons you by name. Again, the Lord says, I will give you, I will give you many things, including great treasures. The exact fulfillment of this came in the vast quantities of pure gold and other valuables that Cyrus took from the kings and kingdoms conquered. The Roman historian Pliny stated that Cyrus, in the conquest of Asia, obtained 34,000 pounds of pure gold be besides many other treasures treasures that Cyrus used to finance the return of the Jews to Jerusalem and the rebuilding of the temple in Jerusalem. Again, the Lord is declaring all of this some 150 years or so before Cyrus even arrived on the scene. What a great and awesome God we serve. Verse 4. For sake of Jacob, my servant of Israel, my chosen, I summon you by name, speaking of Osiris, and bestow on you a title of honor, though you do not acknowledge me. For the sake of God's people in Babylon, God chose and rose up Cyrus, raised up Cyrus, a pagan from Persia, to deliver his people and bestowed on him a title of honor. Even though Cyrus did not acknowledge him in the sense of believing in the God of heaven, but he did acknowledge that it was the Lord, the God of heaven, who had given him all the kingdoms of the earth and appointed him to build a temple for him at Jerusalem in Judah, as we read in Ezra chapter one, verse two. Verses 5 and 6. I am the Lord and there is no other. Apart from me there is no God. I will strengthen you, referring to Cyrus again. Though you have not acknowledged me, so that from the rising of the sun to the place of its setting, people may know that there is none besides me. I am the Lord. And there is no other. Through the prophet Isaiah, the Lord is saying to Cyrus, king of Persia, 150 years or so before he even came on the scene, that he is going to do all of these great things because he is the Lord and there is no other. He will strengthen Cyrus to do all these great and amazing things, even though Cy Cyrus was not a believer but a pagan king so that people in ages to come would know that there is none besides him, that he is the Lord and there is no other, that the people of all nations may know that there is none besides me. I am the Lord and there is no other. Do you know and understand that there is none besides the God of the Bible? that he is Lord over all history and that there is no other, that salvation is to be found in no other. 
as we read in verse 22 of chapter 45. Turn to me and be saved. All you ends of the earth, for I am God and there is no other. The Bible is filled with all kinds of prophecies concerning another anointed one that God would raise up, far greater than Cyrus the Great, for the salvation of all who would come to him, the one who is born of a virgin, the one who would suffer and die as the perfect sacrifice for our sins to bring us to God, the one who is truly Lord, and there is no other. This is the one of whom Luke writes in the book of Acts, chapter 4. There is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven that has been given among men by which we must be saved, Acts 4.12. And that name and that person is Jesus, the one who was raised up to save us from our sin, the one who was raised up to bring us back to God, the one who is God, the one who is Lord over all history. The question this morning is, is he Lord and Savior of your life? Because there is no other. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, Jesus is not simply one among many gods. He was not simply an ordinary prophet, but he was the eternal Son of God who set aside his privileges and prerogatives of God and came to live among us, wrapped himself in human flesh and became obedient even obedient unto the death on the cross that he might bring us salvation through his death, through his resurrection, that we might not only know that he is the only true God, but that we might belong to him for now and for eternity. Bless us as we Come to share in the Lord's Supper this morning. In Jesus' name. Who is worthy to partake of the Lord's Supper? No one. For as the Bible says, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. But all those who are trusting in Christ to forgive their sins, to cleanse them from that guilt and that burden, and who by the grace of God will seek to live, to honor, and magnify, and glorify his name, are invited to come, not because we're worthy, but because we are unworthy and we know it. Let me share this little story that I found concerning communion. It uh, involves a, an old Scottish preacher by the name of Duncan. On one, on one communion Sunday, he observed a woman who seemed very troubled with lack of assurance of her salvation, and therefore passed on taking the cup. And Pastor Duncan stepped down, took the cup, and handed it to the woman, saying in his own dialect, Take it. Take it, woman. Take it. It is for sinners, inferring that you are one. And so are you, and so am I. That's why we need the Savior. That's why only his, clean, his shed blood can cleanse us from our sins and make us acceptable before the throne of God, the one to whom we must give an account one day. 
On the night he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus met with his 12 disciples in the upper room. And having blessed the bread, he broke it and gave it to them, saying, This is my body, which is given for you. Take, eat this too in remembrance of me. After supper, our Lord also took the cup, and having blessed it, he shared it with his disciples, saying, This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you, for the remission of sins. Take, drink, this too, in remembrance of me. This too, in remembrance of me, until I come again. Amen. One of the other hymns that we'll use in our service of worship at St. John's this morning is the hymn, All Hail the Power of Jesus' Name. All hail the power of Jesus' name, let angels prostrate fall. Bring forth a royal diadem and crown him, Lord of all. Ye chosen seed of Israel's race, ye ransomed from the fall. Hail him who saves you by his grace and crown him, Lord of all. Let every kindred, every tribe on this terrestrial wall to him all majesty ascribe and crown him, Lord of all. By his grace and by his mercy, I trust that he is Lord of all in your life this day. Join me in reciting the Lord's Prayer, if you would. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. And now unto him who is able to do immeasurably more than we would ever dare ask or even dream of. To him be glory and honor and praise and adoration now and forevermore. Amen. <laughs>